was huge. I mean, it was big, man. Zamislite da vas usred noći pošalju u nepristupačnu džunglu Južne Amerike ne bi li osigurali pad nepoznate letilice. No međutim, ubrzo shvatite da ovo mjesto rušenja ne izgleda kao tipično mjesto na kojem se srušila konvencionalna letilica. Te zatim shvatite da je vaša postrojba greškom došla na ovo mjesto te nije ni trebala vidjeti ono što je vidjela. Kako bi se osjećali u tom trenutku jer najgore za vas je tek slijedilo. Ovo je priča razvodnika marinskog korpusa Jonathana Veganta koji u svojoj karijeri doživio nešto što mu i dan danas izaziva noćne more. I njegova priča danas kao nikad prije baca novo svjetlo na zastrašujuće zakolisne igre koje se događaju po cijelom svijetu. Ovo je njegova priča. Dobrodošli na Balkan UFO kanal. Današnja priča i svjedočanstvo ovog čovjeka bi svakako u jednom trenutku došlo na red na Balkan UFO kanalu, jer svjedočanstvo Jonathana Veganta je u ovom trenutku ostarilo kao vrhunsko i kvalitetno vino. Vino koje je stalo u nekom podrumu više od 20 godina. Jer upravo je toliko stara njegova priča koja danas više nego ikad dobiva na značaju s obzirom na nedavna svjedočanstva Davida Graša pred američkim kongresom. Jer ovaj čovjek koliko god pričao zanimljive priče. Nije osobno doživio ovakve događaje nego ih je predstavio kongresu kao svjedočanstva i to dan danas aktivnih ljudi u vojnoj službi američke vojske ali obavištenih agencija. David Graš je u svojim istragama razgovarao s ljudima baš kao Jonathan Vegant koji još prije 23 godine UFO istraživaču doktoru Stevenu Greeru ispričao ovu današnju nevjerojatnu priču. Jer u to vrijeme imali ste samo dva izbora, ili bi zašli u medije riskirali smijavanje ili bi svoje svjedočanstvo povjerili provjerenim UFO istraživačima. Jonathan Vegan se odlučio na ovo drugo, te 2000. godine u velikom valu svjedočanstva vojnog osoblja koje organizirao dr. Steven Greer po prvi put odlučio ispričati svoju priču. Tada i više nikad, sve do prije nekoliko dana. Razlog zašto sam odlučio da je vrijeme da poslušate i ovog čovjeka na Balkanu i kanalu je taj što je prije samo nekoliko dana, nakon više od 20 godina i to vjerojatno inspirira nedanim događajima iz američkog kongresa, ponovno pokušao ispričati ovu priču. Ali ovaj put u intervju, to jest podcastu za koji ću vam link ostaviti u deskripciji ovog današnjeg videa. U ovom najnovijem podcastu ovaj čovjek nije zapravo rekao ništa novo. I sam podcast je poprilično razočaravajući ako ste ikada pogledali njegovo originalno svjedočanstvo koje ćete imati priliku vidjeti u današnjem videu. Jonathan Vegant danas nažalost izgleda kao jedna obična ljuska i olupina nekadašnjeg čovjeka. Jedan od vjerojatnih uzroka za to je kako sam kaže... Događaj i teror koji je toga dana 1997. godine trajno promijenio život, nakon čega je dobio i posttraumatski stres zbog kojeg i dan danas ima noćne more kada se prisjeti toga dana i događaja i džungle Perua. Nedavno smo također imali jako zanimljivu i bizarnu priču iz Perua. Danas se vraćamo u ovu državu koja je kroz svoju povijest skrivala neke zaista bizarne događaje. Jer ako je ova priča bila previše bizarna, pričekajte samo da poslušate ovog čovjeka. No prije nego krenemo na ovu priču, red je da vam i predstavimo ovog čovjeka. Jonathan Vegant je bio marinac koji je američku vojsku ušao u 7. mjesecu 1994. godine, nakon pješačke obuke u Fort Geiger u Sjevernoj Karolini. U prvom mjesecu 1996. godine postaje operater na mobilnoj i Stinger lansirnoj platformi. 1997. godine dobiva prekomandu i to u 28. zračno krilo marinskog korpusa te se dobrovoljno javlja za misiju inozemstvo gdje ga 1997. godine šalju u sklopu Laser Strike programa u Peru gdje je radio kao vojno osiguranje za radarsku stanicu i postrojbu koja je pratila kljumčare i šverc narkotika i droga. I upravo na tom mjestu su se uskoro počelo događati čudne stvari. 
jer od sklopove baze su bile i druge nacije. Jonathan se jasno sjećao Kineza i Njemaca koji su radili na obukama peruanaca, te se tada u tom trenutku i čudio. Što ovakva međunarodna ekipa ima veze sa trgovinom drogama u Peru i zašto bi se oni brinuli za nekakvo švercanje droge u Sjedin američke države? Stvari su uskoro postale još čudnije kada je čuo vojno osoblje unutar radarske stanice kako dosta često i aktivno registriraju neobične letelice koje brzinama većim od 10.000 km na sat u sekundi napuštaju te se vraćaju u zemlju na atmosferu. Prema njegovim tvrdnjama ovakve stvari se događale jako često. Stvari su definitivno postale još čudnije kada bi visoki častnici dolazili to periodično u kontrolnu sobu i trajno uzimali sve radarske podatke koji su u suštini i pljenili. Te im radarski operateri više ne bi nimali pristup. Situacija iz ovog čovjeka i njegovu postrebu kulminirala kada se početkom 4. mjesta 1997. godine jedne noći nije dogodio jedan ogroman incident. Kada se u džungli na nekoliko sati udaljenosti od njihovih položaja radarske stanice srušila letilica. Po svemu sudeći prema dojavi koju je dobio njegov narednik, bila je to prijateljska letelica, to jest srušeni avion. Te njegova postrojba od desetak ljudi kreću u potragu za mjesto rušenja i eventualnim spašavanjem. No kada su došli na mjesto na koje nisu ni smjeli otići, shvatili su da ovo nije bio nikakav avion. Ovo je bilo nešto potpuno drugo. Uostalno poslušajte njegovo fantastično i originalno svjedočanstvo, sada već staro 23 godine. We got a situation where we we have one an aircraft crash that's possibly friendly and they need us to go and, and secure the crash site. And we're like fine. So well, this is early this is late at night. I know about 11 or 12 at night. And I was on guard duty that night, so I was already up and it was my shift. We have 12 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off. And where we where we rotate the, the, the our section. Uh, so we all went out that night. We got up i don't know, three or four in the morning and headed out in Humvees. We had about five or six Hummers and we drove to where we needed to go and then we, from there, you know, we had to hump through the bush. So we got there, I don't know, six, seven, just, just one daylight, had just, just started to get light. And uh, well, we found the area really easy because there, there was a huge gash in the land where, where something had crashed and it, it It didn't break anything, you know, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a crash site where, you know, you had, you know, trees, you know, just broken like, like in half. Everything was burned and it was like, like if you had almost cut like a, a warm butter with a knife. I mean, it was just, it's like, it's, it's like something on fire or had energy or some kind of energy, like a laser almost had, had like gutted. I mean, it was really strange. And anyway, I was, I was in the front with Sergeant Allen, Sergeant Atkins, we were up front. And we were, we were point basically, and we were like I don't know 10, 20 meters ahead of everyone else. We had, we all had maps and radios and compasses, so we knew so we wouldn't get lost. And basically, we were the first ones to see the object. And basically, what happened is, we didn't go straight up the hill, because basically this thing went up the hill and then off into the side of of, of, of the ravine or the ridge. This is about a 200 foot ridge at least solid granite or i mean i don't it's rock i don't know if it's granite it's just, it was buried in, a, in in the side of the cliff but anyway we didn't go straight up we went to the to the to on to the left and walked up to the top of the ridge and that's when we saw the craft this is a huge ship and you know i i used to be in the sci-fi movies when i was a kid but this is nothing like i'd ever seen and when i first saw it you know i was scared it scared the end of the heck out of me you know i didn't know what to do and And it was just, I was con really, it was really confusing. So we, I went, we all climbed down and um, it was, it was buried for about a 45 degree angle and into the side of the, uh, into the, into the side of the, the, the cliff there, the, the, the ridge. And uh, I mean, this is a steep cliff. I mean, it's straight up and down. And uh, it was dripping this surp like, uh, like surf viscosity, this liquid, uh, it was everywhere, all down everywhere when we went down there because there was plants and everything and it was it was weird it was a, a, a purplish green color and it was it was gr a greenish purple and it kind of like f like fluctuated like you couldn't really when you, you'd look at it one time then you look at it again and it would like it's almost like it I don't know if it was like alive and it was just changing but every time you looked at it you saw a different shade of, of greenish purple it was strange there was a, there was one light on it that slowly went around and, it, and, and the machine, I could hear it. 
I could hear, I guess because it was still functioning, and it had like a, like a, a hum to it, like, like a really bass, like say if you unplugged an amp from a guitar, that kind of, mm, you know, it was really, really, you know, it was really deep, and it kind of fluctuated, and then finally it just cut off, and everything just seemed to stop, except the colors and the shades, and it was still that way. Uh, when I was looking at the craft, it was buried, so I could see the back of it, and there were these large vents. Well, that, they look like vents, sort of like a fish gill on the back. I couldn't see around the other side, and I guess I'm assuming that it was the same way on the other side. That looked like I don't know that, that they could that could have been used for propulsion. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, again, this 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 liquid that had come out of the ship was it got on my camis, and you know it it. It discolored them and ate them almost like acid. And then it ate some of the skin off, excuse me, the, the hair off my arms. And it was, and, and I didn't know that until later on. But basically when I was down there with the ship, there was three holes. And I guess I'd assume that they were hatches, but I, 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 there's no way to tell. They were not flush with the, uh, with, with the body, the main body of the craft. They were, I don't know, a few inches below. I knew there was one on top because you could s slightly see it. I don't know about the other side, but the, there was another hatch, the same same width and diameter or whatever of the top hatch, and it was kind of crooked to the side, and it was half open. And I didn't see any lights or anything coming out of it, but uh, I felt this presence. That it, and it's real strange. I guess it was almost like I think the cre. I, I told Leslie this. I thought the creatures were they conned me, and, and it was like weird. And they were. I think they were trying to communicate with me. Like I guess telepathically, it's really weird, and I don't believe in it, in any of that stuff. But anyway, it was I could I could hear like, and it was terrible because it, it kept going, and, and then it still comes and goes. It's like basically sitting in your car and turn on like an AM station, that's not that you, you know it's just white noise and it's turning it up really high, and that's what I heard when I when I first got in there. Uh, this is pretty crude two-dimensional drawing, but this is jungle here. This was the craft, and it, it was embedded uh, in, 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 in the rock like this. And I, I'm not sure if this tapered off or, or how it went, but uh, these right here are the hatches, these two objects here. This one was the one that was half open, and you could see into it, but, I mean, it was just black. It was like looking into a closet. Ten meters in width and about tw 20 meters in length. I'm just not sure. That's just an estimate from what I remember. But it was huge. I mean, it was big, man. And it was shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop almost. It was really, it looked really aerodynamic, at least in the shape. But the closer I, I was close enough to take out detail on it, but every, every, it was not just smooth. There was, there was, you know, there was bumps and you know notches and things in it. It was really organic. It was almost like art. I, that, that, that's really how you would. It didn't look like something that that somebody made in a shop, you know. It didn't have that clunkiness or that that that, that tin can, you know, kind of deal. It was more of a it was more of art, I would I would say. It looked to be that it was it, it could have been handmade, but you know, out of what and what materials I don't know. Definitely not nothing like it, nothing like titanium. It wasn't. It see this is the whole thing. It looked metal, but it, it didn't it didn't have any reflection on it, man. I mean, you know, the the the, the sun's coming down, and if you got something made of metal, regardless of it. I mean, maybe if it's subdued with paint and it's got a cami sheen on it, you know, you're not going to see a reflection. But you know, I could see the different the different shades of the craft. They didn't shine. It, it just like it was. It didn't reflect anything. And and I guarantee if I if I threw like a, a flashlight on it, wouldn't have reflected it. Well, the creatures I think were calling me to help them. Everything was going to be all right. Then I was so mesmerized and into it, and you know. Sergeant Allen and Atkins, they're, they're hollering and they're cussing at me, you know, get the hell out of there. Why? Well, I, I think they, why, they, I think that they were scared and they didn't want me to get hurt. I don't, I don't know. And they were real pissed off at me after subsequently. But uh, basically what happened was uh, after we climbed back up, the, uh, the, the, I think the DOE, Department of Energy people were there. They knew about it. And I don't know why we went there still to this day. But anyway, I was arrested. Uh, I had all my gear taken from me by men in black camis, had no, no name tags. They, they were older men, probably in their thir late 30s or 40s. How long was I at the site? Uh, probably about 15, 20 minutes. We were the first people on the, on, the, 
on the position, yeah. And then shortly you said there were other people. Right, uh, there were other people. I guess they were government. I don't know. They were there, and they had containment suits, and they they had guys. They they had a position that 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 was that looked like I don't know if it was already there or there was some gap in the jungle where they landed two CH forty seven Chinooks, their army uh, uh, twin rotor uh, you know helicopters and they're big and they had guys coming out in these containment suits. They must have just got there I don't know while we were down in the gorge because when we climbed up there those guys were and the, well there were the the guys in the black camis. And then they took me, they put me on a cot that they had, and they had me uh, cuffed with those, uh, they had me cuffed both hands down, and then they had my, uh, my, my, my legs tied together with those, those uh, plastic fasteners that the police use. I don't know, you know, they're like, kind of like cuffs. And then they took me in the CH-47, and they, they, they sent me to, we, we took off, and, and, uh, and uh, they, they didn't drug me or anything like that, and I was just awake there. And, they explain why they were treating you this way? No, no, they said that, you know, that, 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 that I was, they were cussing at me, saying that I was a dumb asshole, and that why don't you, why don't you fucking people ever, you know, pay attention to orders, and you weren't supposed to be there, and you're not supposed to see this, and, you, you know, you're, you're going to be dangerous if we let you go, and all this stuff, you know. I mean, I thought I was going to, I thought they were going to kill me for about two days, I think. And uh, they had a, a, a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, and he did not I identify himself. He might have. I just don't remember. And he told me, you know, you know, uh, you know, if we just uh, took you out in the jungle, you know, they'd never find you out there. And I'm like, well, and you know, I, I didn't want to say, you know, you know, I didn't want to test him to see if he'd really do that. So I said, yeah. And he's like, you got to sign these papers, and you never saw this, and I don't exist, and this situation never happened. And if you tell anybody, uh, you know, you, you'll just come up missing and. And he was a real abrasive, just 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 an, uh, a cynical uh, asshole, I guess is the best way to put it. It was I was at the same installation, but they had me segregated with Air Force personnel for like three weeks, and then after that, I was sent back, approximately. All I saw there was Americans, and there was a lot of other nationalities there. Chinese, Germans, I think, were there. I mean, a lot of other people were at this other base. But I mean, this thing it was really. It, I mean, I didn't go in and. All they did was take me to like a, a like a you couldn't call it a cell. It was more of like a it was more like an interrogation room, and I sat in there for I don't know 15 hours. Of those guys with the with the, with the light, and I mean they put this light in my face, and they were yelling at me, and, and I couldn't really re readily identify any of these guys, but I knew I knew that I knew one of them was at the at the crash site because they were one of the guys that I recognized because he was in uh, black fatigues, and he was like. What'd you see? And he's like, yeah, he's like growling. Mm. You know, he goes, are you a patriot? You like the Constitution? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, we don't, we do it. You know, we're on our own program. You know, we don't obey. We just do what we want. And he's like, yeah. And they're like, mm, and they're growling and they're relishing, you know, and they're yelling at me and they're, they're hollering and cursing and you didn't see anything, you know, and we'll do you and your whole goddamn family. And they're, they're you know, it was, it was basically that for about eight or nine hours. I mean, they took breaks. They were like, look, man, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna just, we're gonna take you off in a helicopter and just kick your ass out, out in, out in the jungle and you're just gonna, you're, you know, we're gonna end you and all this. And they didn't physically, they didn't physically put their hands on me, but I was sitting in a chair and I was handcuffed in a chair and I couldn't move. So basically, you know, it was just a, this, this like harassment. I, I didn't eat anything for like a whole day. No water, no nothing. I just sat there. Uh, my section was about eight, eight to ten guys. They all saw it? No, uh, no, just me, Sergeant Allen, and Sergeant Atkins were the only ones that saw it. Now they saw the crash, and well, at least you know the the, the jungle where it, where it came through. They saw all that, but they didn't go into the ridge because, like I said, we were ten to twenty meters in front of them, and they radioed to you know to haul that we found it, and everything's fine. I was in it was in late March, early April of '97. So we're talking, like when I got back, you know, I approached Sergeant Allen about it, because of course he's married and he's got like a, one or two kids. And I went to his house on, the, on base housing, and he got all upset and threw me out of his house. Said he didn't want to talk about it. And I mean, they scared. I guess they scared those guys too, man. And see, I mean, you got to understand. You know, I can't speak for the rest of the armed service, but the Marine Corps, everything's it's you know it's monolithic. And uh, when they're told to do something, they're gonna they're gonna do it. And, and, and
and if you don't want to go along, they'll just they'll, 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 they'll basically railroad you. I didn't want to keep my mouth shut about it. And I told my first sergeant, uh, first sergeant pal, I told him about it. And I don't even know if he, I don't think he's still there anymore. I mean, we're talking three years ago. So, uh, yeah, so it was life forms in the ship. I, and I could, they were, it's almost like if someone was like reading your mind and that's the way it felt. And I felt like, uh, I felt a presence. It was like supernatural, you know, it was no debris that I saw, but there were big gashes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the rear of the, uh, of the aircraft. And I, what I looked, what it looked like is it had been hit with maybe a serviced air missile. Uh, there were a couple Hawk batteries, and that's a homing all the way killer. That's a uh, low to medium uh, air, uh, surface air anti anti aircraft missile. And basically, it doesn't have to hit the target in order to destroy the target. What it does is it gets in proximity of it, and it, and it has a high explosive fragmentation warhead, and it basically explodes like a big shotgun in the vicinity of the of the of the, uh, the, the targeted uh, area, and it, and by fragmentation, it's supposed to destroy the target or, 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 in, uh, or damage it so it won't be able to continue its mission. So it, I think we shot it down. This is what I think happened is we shot it down, the Peruvian shot it down, the other guys knew it was flying. I knew that these, these aircraft were flying because I had been in the command center there at the radar installation and, and, and I heard a couple women there in the Air Force talking about aircraft uh, flying in and out of the atmosphere at Mach 10 plus. So these aircraft are flying around there, you know, they're, you know, they're re-entering the atmosphere and whatever. And, you know, I believe that the higher ups knew it was flying in the area. And these were these large vents. They looked like they went into the craft, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell. But it, I mean, it was a shadow. That was the only thing that really cast a shadow. The rest of this, well, this is another thing was it, these vents casted a shadow where you could see where there wasn't light, but the, sh the sun was shining right on the object and it didn't cast a shadow, not on, on anything. And it was like, kind of like absorbing the light, it was weird. This is not one of ours, cause you know, I'm, you know, in Stinger school, they teach you about all different kinds of aircraft and stuff like that. And I knew, I knew a lot of aircraft anyway, cause I, I like, I like reading about aircraft and data and that stuff. And uh, well, essentially when I saw it, I'm like, man, this is not, this is nothing that I knew of. Okay, basically the radar, was, was sitting, and this was again on a hill, it's cammied up and you know, it rotates and everything. And there's a command bunker that was built under the, under the, under the earth. And I mean, it looks like Star Wars in there. And I mean, it's, it's total air conditioned. I mean, it's really nice. And there's like computers and they got the, the, uh, the you know, the control panels and everything that control the radars. And they're, I guess they're linked to other sites, you know, and they get other data coming in. and. Well, we had guard duty, and I, I and the night that this happened, this was in the early evening, and I, it was my shift, and I was in there, and I was checking people going in and out. You know, they got ID, you know, checking out, whatever. So, like, these two girls, they come walking out, and they're talking about, well, we got these aircraft flying again, and, and the other girl says, yeah, you know, they're coming in and out of the atmosphere. But, but he came in there, and he told me to come back with them, and we go back there, and and he goes, I want the logs, because they log all these flights coming in, you know, they're bearing what they are, what code they're squawking, all that. So he gets the books, and I had to sign off for him to take all that. I mean, when you got when you got objects that are re-entering the atmosphere and then stopping on a dime and then turning around and going exactly the opposite direction, you know, that's kind of strange. Meteors don't do that. Now, is this something that was rare or something that was happening? Pretty oh, this this happened all the time. There was like three or four incidents where I was duty there that the same uh, the same Air Force officer came in there to get books. And do you think these were tracked on radars? That yeah, that, the, the, these were tracked from this particular radar that were logged in. The reason, I, I guess the reason they were taking them is they didn't want people to know that they're tracking these aircraft. I guess, I, I mean, again, this, I'm just assuming that. So, uh, when I saw the uh, the aircraft, it had been hit by something, something that had that had took it out. They were scared, and it was the, the apprehension, the fear, and then that they, that they that they were not here to harm us. That's really what what it felt like. And I mean, that's not that's not my own emotions. I've seen the creatures in my in my thoughts, and uh, I've seen I've and I, I saw them what they look like: oval egg head with big dark eyes, big eyes. Uh, a nose and a small mouth, new ears.
And they were projecting that they weren't here. They were here. They were here to. They, they weren't here. You know, that they, they were not going to harm me. And that was basically that everything was going to be all right. Just help me get. Just help us get out of here. I think there was. I don't. I don't. I don't know how many were on the craft. You had to sense more than one. Yeah, definitely more than one. Probably about four or five. Did, did I think it was organic and alive? Yeah, yeah. I think that. Uh, I think uh, that, that 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 whole craft. It, it's kind of like. It's almost like if you had an extension like your arm or your leg, and uh, I think the way they can. Now, I mean, this is just from thinking about it. That that. The way they control the craft is with their thoughts, and they have no, no buttons or anything they push. It's not from Earth. And I mean, I knew that when I looked at it, you know. I mean, I'm not doing this to make money or, or publicity or anything, but I, I think it needs to be told, and I think people need to hear it. Whether they agree with me or not is, is of no consequence. Their cover was there to track uh, to track drug aircraft. I, I think, I, I don't know, but from what I understand, that they were doing a whole lot more than just tracking drug aircraft. I mean, they had um, laser range finders and all kinds of high-tech stuff that I've never seen before. And I couldn't really explain. I knew that there was a couple of LRFs there. I don't know what they were, uh, LRF laser range finder. I don't know what they had those do there, but they were huge, man. Looked like big telescopes, but they had them in a bunker. And they were, it was able to rise up, and they can zoom around. And I saw them doing that. I mean, just a bunch of weird stuff. And then, not even that, we had like a live fire shoot in the jungle, and there was... Green Berets, Army Airborne, I mean, a bunch of these spec ops guys, uh, Delta Force there, you know, the murderers at Waco were there, you know, so, you know, all these, you know, all these guys out there, I mean, the Chinese, Chinese are there, you know, they're out there training, man, and we're, they're training the Peruvians too, so, it's weird, man, weird situation. Oh, this is definitely something like NATO or some multi, uh, multinational deal. And what I, I keep, you know, I keep going back and really thinking about that. Why are all these guys here? You know, why would the Chinese be concerned with drugs being smuggled, or you know, or any kind of drug paraphernalia being smuggled into the states? I mean, personally, I mean, I know for a fact that our government are the ones that are importing drugs. I mean, you know, there, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, but the fact, uh, the, do I think that 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 this this command center? I think it was permanent. I think it's been an operation for a while. They had the big D, you know, Delta Oscar Echo on, on the back of their, back of a couple of the guys were wearing like these, uh, these rain jackets, because it had been raining the fall the previous day, and they were in there, and there were other guys that were wearing containment like biological suits. It wasn't like that. It was more high tech, like those big jumpsuits that you zip up the back, and you can, like, wear a breathing apparatus in there. Those guys, there was about 30 of them at least. And they marched right by me as I was as I was being taken away. They were marching to get down into the cliff. I guess they were in there to check this thing out. What do I think happened? I think they went in there and they took everything out and they shipped it back home. I think the behavior of the people. Yeah, it was definitely it was. This is routine, man. I mean, these guys are squared away. They know exactly what they're doing. They've been trained to do this stuff before. That was the atmosphere. The total professional cold. Uh, unassuming uh, nature, you know, it's just, you know, we're here to do a job and, you know, get the fuck out of our ways is basically the, the attitude. I was raised in a Christian home to believe that there was a God and that he created everything, you know, the universe, and here they are, these, these creatures that I've never seen before, never come in contact with, and this happens, man, and it just, it made me go cr almost crazy, you know, not like suicidal, but I, I just couldn't, I had to like reevaluate everything that I knew. It's sort of like when you're a kid, you know, you've been told Santa Claus is, 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 you know, real, and then you find out that he's really not, and then the tooth fairy, you know, it's like now that you know there's no going back, there's like no, there's no denial, there's no saying, well, you know, this is, you know, I didn't really see this, and, and I couldn't really deal with it, you know, it was that, is that what do I do, you know, do I tell people? But I mean, who's going to believe that? That, that, a, that a Lance Corporal in the, Marine Corps, or in the Marine Corps in the middle of the fucking jungle is gonna see an aircraft like this. It's more like I was sitting and watching a, like, a, like a film. Like I was sitting and I was watching what was happening and I was, uh, I was basically, you know, with these aliens, these creatures and they were touching me. You know, not, not like sexually or with uh, instruments or anything. Uh, they were holding my hands and they had their hands on me. And they only had four fingers, by the way. And what feeling did you get from it? It was a warm, like, loving feeling, uh, like, like you would have if you were with a family. 
these creatures are like, I guess you could, probably the closest thing I could say that they were like almost like angels. And if, if I had to, I, I'd go with them right now. I, I mean, I'd get, I, 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 and I had this obsession with that, you know, I guess it was, I guess because of the pain of the experience and then the Marine Corps that I just wanted to escape, you know, and, uh, and, and I, I was thinking about, you know, being with these creatures a lot and wanting to go with them and wanting to get out of here. Because these different agencies are just on their own. They, they, they don't obey the law. They, they're just, they're rogue, you know, they're just, they're just off on their own. I don't, do I think this is a project that goes up through the government and everyone has a piece in it? Uh, no. I think these guys just operate on their own. No one knows what they do. These guys, they're just off on their own. Uh, there's no oversight, no control. They just do whatever they want. They don't, I mean, and, and they're evil, man. These people are evil. Uh, you know, do I think it goes to Bill Clinton and to the Congress? There may be guys up there that knew about it. They're not going to say anything, man. If they say anything, you know, they're, they're through, you know. For those of you who don't know, and I, I, knew, I knew Marine snipers that, I, and, I, and I've heard other guys talk about it, and, and uh, I've heard that, that these guys, you know, they go on the streets and they stalk people and they kill them. Uh, I know that Air Force, I know that, excuse me, that Army Airborne snipers do the same thing. They use Delta Force to, uh, to, go, to go grab these people and silence them by killing them. Uh, and maybe something else I ought to tell them. Well, you know, if this goes on, uh, where do they get the money to finance all this and stuff? Well, very simply, either they're selling arms, they're selling drugs. A lot, a lot of this business about, you know, having uh, the spec ops and they get these unlimited amounts of money, well, they're not coming, it's not coming from the government coffer. It's coming from running drugs or weapons. Ovo današnje svjedočanstvo ovog čovjeka je kako god okrenite poprilično bizarno. I kao i obično neću vam sugerirati govori li ovaj čovjek istinu ili ne, neka svatko od vas sam za sebe procijeni prema izrečenom ovom videu. Ali s obzirom da je zadnjih 30 godina samo iz Sjedine američke država došlo više stotina ovakvih svjedočanstva ne računajući ostatak svijeta, gdje su svjedoci bili vojno osoblje, piloti ili pripadnici obavištanih agencija i s obzirom na svjedočanstva Davida Graša od nedavno, Moramo i kako imati otvoren pogled na ovakve stvari. I moramo biti otvoreni prema mogućnosti da ovaj čovjek zapravo govori istinu. Jer za jednog lažova ako je lažovu riječ, ovaj čovjek je nevjerojatno fluidan. Jako je teško u hodu izmišljati ovako detaljne stvari. Ali to naravno ne mora ništa značiti jer imate osobe koje jesu u stanju na ovakav način lagati. Iako su jako, jako rijetki. Ono što je meni osobno interesantno je to što je ovo tako reći još jedna potvrda onoga što se danas događa u Washingtonu i to potvrda stara više od 20 godina kada se o takvim stvarima nije ni pomišljalo otvoreno govoriti u javnosti, a kamo li u američkom kongresu. I u današnjem svjedočanstvu imali ste priliku vidjeti i to iz prve ruke, ono čemu danas govori David Grash. Tajna međunarodna organizacija koja zajedno mimo zakona svojih država radi na ovakvim tajnim projektima i organizacije koje se najvjerojatnije i to ilegalno financiraju ovakvi novce. Drugim riječima, ovo su kriminalne organizacije koje očigledno od javnosti skrivaju ovakve bizarne događaje. I ne znam da li ste primijetili, ali ovo danas je samo jedan primjer od ogromnog broja primjera kada se ovakve letelice namjerno iz nekog razloga ruše. Tko ili što ih ruši je još uvijek kupitno, ali ovaj de facto u ovom svjedočanstvu još jedna potvrda i to nevidljivog rata koji se događa iza naših glava. I čini se da ovakva stvorenja s ovakvim vojnim tehnologijama i nisu više toliko neranjiva kao nekada. I ovdje je Jonathan Vagant čak izrazio svoje mišljenje u kojem kaže da je ovakva letelica najvjerojatnije srušena sa projektilom, to jest raketom, zemlja zrak. Što je po mom skromnom mišljenju krajnje nevjerojatno, jer osobno poznajem par desetak slučajeva kada se aktivno pokušavalo srušiti ovakve objekte putem konvencionalnog naoružanja. O mnogim ovakvim slučajima smo već govorili na kanalu. Nikad nisu bili ni blizu rušenja ovakvih letelica i dosta često bi u takvim pokušajima piloti poginuli. Stoga ako ljudi jesu srušili ovakvu letelicu ili možda netko drugi, a o tome planiram uskoro i puno opširnije jednoj odličnoj teme koja dolazi uskoro na kanalu. Ovo su napravili pomoću nečega drugoga, sigurno ne ovakve tehnologije. Jer naravno ako se dokopali davnih dana ovakvih tehnologija kako danas tvrdi David Graš, sigurno se dokopali daleko naprednijeg naoružanja koje je sposobno rušiti ovako napredne letilice. I žalosno je to što ovaj čovjek PTSP, to jest psihičku bolest i traumu, 
zaradio ne na račun šoka koji je doživio dok se ova bića pokušavala komunicirati s njim, iako ga je to poprilično pogodilo jer koga ne bi. Žalostno je to što je većina njegovog stresa došla od ljudi, ne ovakvi stvorenja. I ovam je fantastičan primjer zašto se ovakvi svidoci rijetko kada ubijaju te na takav način ušutkavaju. Zastrašivanje ovakvih ljudi je upalilo na svima osim na ovom čovjeku. Svi drugi pripadnici njegove postrojbe nisu nikad izašli u javnost. On je izašao u javnosti to tri godine nakon ovih događaja te ispričao svoju priču. A što se dogodilo nakon ove priče? Apsolutno ništa. Mislim da ovakvi ljudi unutar ovakvih tajnih programa spavaju bezbrižno kao bebe i zaboli ih John što priča tamo neki razvodnik. Zastrašivanje kod ovog čovjeka nije uspjelo. Koga briga, jer tko na kraju krajeva sluša ovakve ljude? Preteža nekakvi luđaci sa aluminijskim folijama na svojim glavama. Nije da je ovaj tip imao nekakav komad metala i dio trupa koji je uspio prošvercati. E tad bi to bila potpuno drugačija priča. Ovako, koga briga za nekog tamo niže rangiranog marinca? Dok sam ponovno slušao ovu priču prevodeći ovaj video za vas i slušajući ogroman broj sličnih priča, gotovo sam uvjeren da ovakvi ljudi koji imaju toliku moć u svojim rukama, nikada, ma baš nikada i to mirnim putem neće predati tu svoju moć i svu ovu tehnologiju i znanje. I nema tog kongresa i saslušanja koje će to promijeniti. Ovo je ekipa koja je nevjerojatno moćna i međunarodno razgranata i ako stvarno posjedu ovako moćne tehnologije i znanja, a po svemu sudeći izgleda posjedu i tko zna s kim još surađuju, pitanje je da li se uopće i može pojaviti netko na zemlji uz ovakve prijetnje. Ali s obzirom da ne znamo cijelu priču, uzmite s rezervom tko je u cijelu ovoj priči zapravo pozitivac, a tko negativac. Jer situacija ovdje dosta često poprilično siva i bio bi vam potreban poprilično veliki bager da iskopate pravu istinu koja je očigledno negdje jako duboko zakopana. Što ne znači da nemamo potrebu istraživati i tražiti odgovore. I nemojte nikada zaboraviti. Ova ekipa manipulira sa ljudskom civilizacijom od samih početaka i nisu uvijek anđelske raspoloženi, kao što je to bio slučaj s ovim čovjekom. Njihova igra je igra iluzija i igra obmana, i nikada, ama baš nikada, nisu to prestali raditi. A do idućeg videa, vi ste na Balkanu i FO kanalu, mjesto gdje istina poneka zvuči čudni od fikcije. Vidimo se uskoro opet. Lijep pozdrav!